to be this morning. Uh, but definitely there are buckets downstairs for the kids, and I'm being told, yeah, if you want to grab those and bring them back up, please feel free to do so. Uh, regarding the text, um, I enjoyed taking a big picture look at a well-known text last week that was Jonah. In fact, we looked at the entire book, and I enjoyed identifying some practical lessons there. I got the impression you guys enjoyed it as well. So I just thought I might do that again just for fun, and uh, I just, just go with my gut sometimes. But this week we're going to look at an account in the book of Genesis during the earthly lives of the sons of Jacob, that is to say the children of Israel. <clears throat> the idea here is that these people, that is to say the sons of Israel, literal sons of Israel, were the foundation of God's chosen people through whom God would extend his redemption plan to the whole earth. And these men would go on to form the great tribes of such names as Reuben and Simeon, the tribes of Issachar and Zebulun, the tribes of Gad and Asher, and the tribes of Dan and Naphtali, and furthermore, there are other big names as well, like uh, Joshua and Samuel, who would descend from the tribe of Ephraim, and King Saul, who would descend from the tribe of Benjamin, and Moses and Aaron, who would descend from the tribe of Levi, and of course, there is King David and the entire kingly line, and Christ himself, who descended from the tribe of Judah. And so this is a big deal. As Christians, we call these men our spiritual forefathers. And they played an integral role, integral part, in the redemption through Christ uh, that we enjoy today. And with this in mind, there's a question I want to explore, and that is, what were these men like? How did they conduct themselves from day to day? And believe it or not, in Genesis chapter 37, which is our text this morning, we get a clue as to what these guys were like day to day at an extended period of time in their life. So follow along with me. This is Genesis 37, verses 1 through 36. Again, a good section of text, but the Old Testament is historical narrative, a great deal of it, and so sometimes we have to cover a little bit more ground in order to get the idea. It says, Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. And these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers, whilst he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to, the, to this dream which I have had. For behold, we are binding sheaves in a field, or excuse me, we were binding sheaves in a field, and lo, my sheaf rose and stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still had another dream, and behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Then his brothers went to pasture their flocks in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, are, your, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to them, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, what are, you, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have moved from here. I have heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. When they, that is to say his brothers, saw him from a distance, 
And before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. <coughs> they said one to another, here comes this dreamer. And then, excuse me, they said, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him in this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our, to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up they pulled, they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they, bought, they brought Joseph to Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat, dipped the tunic in the blood, and they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please examine it to see whether this is your son's tunic or not. When he examined it, he said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for many days for his son. Then all of his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And thanks for bearing with me on that. As Christians, excuse me, uh, we see this whole family as forefathers. Um, we, we, they preceded us and we're here to kind of learn what they're like and what their lives were like from day to day. And at first glance, as we read through this here, it's a bit troubling. And as I stop and read through accounts like this, and really consider what's going on in detail, it's even more so. Because have you ever had that experience where you read these accounts and you hear them so many times and you glaze over them and you think about the future and you don't necessarily stop and just look at the nitty-gritty details of what was going on there? The more I stop and just zero in on that, the more troubled I become. Uh, I find the incident to be truly, truly awful. What we see is that Jacob's older sons despised Joseph. That is to say, they hated him. Why? Uh, for several reasons which compounded upon each other. Jacob favored Joseph over them, and he eventually gave Joseph a multicolored tunic or a coat of many colors, which probably signaled Jacob's intention to treat him as the primary heir. It was probably a status thing, most scholars agree, that it was probably a statement of his intention to treat him as the primary heir to get the double portion of the inheritance and such things as that. Also, Joseph brought negative reports about his older brother's conduct to Jacob, which by all account were probably true. And finally, Joseph started having these dreams about his preeminence over his brothers, and he naively shared them with them, not really understanding just how angry his brothers were getting. And so all of this simmered under the surface to a slow boil of hatred. And for that reason, when they saw Joseph approaching them in the middle of nowhere, where no one would see, they had the idea and initiated a plan to kill him. Now, under Reuben's advice, they revised the plan to leaving him to die in a cistern. Uh, and then Judah revised it further, saying, let's not kill him, let's sell him. He is our blood, he is our family, we shouldn't kill him, so let's just sell him off as a slave instead. And that sounds a lot more humane there, but that's exactly what he said there. Then they lied about his death to Jacob and got on with their lives, expecting to never see or hear from Joseph ever again. You ever stop and think about that and go, that is chilling. That is chilling. 
It's even more chilling as you compare this with the account sometime later. Um, there's, it's, it's in verse 42 when they're dealing with, jo- with Joseph in, in Egypt before they realize it's him. But remember, it says that they threw him into the cistern and then they sat down to a meal. They threw him into a cistern and then they sat down and started eating. Well, it says in verses 42 and 21 that he pleaded and begged them for help and they just kept sitting there and eating and ignoring him. It says, then they said to one another, this is when they were dealing with Joseph and didn't realize it yet and they were coming into trouble. Then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And so he's begging them and they're just ignoring him and eating their meal. So this is a terrible, terrible situation. This is a truly dysfunctional family. And there are other incidents as well with some of the brothers that are happening in and around this time that are not mentioned that I'll just highlight for you. We're not going to turn there. But if you're taking note, uh, if you look in Genesis chapter 34, there Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, deceive and then revenge massacre a whole settlement because the prince of that settlement named Shechem uh, violated their sister. He did something terrible to their sister, no question about it. They retaliated by killing the entire city. Uh, That was Simeon and Levi in uh, chapter 34. Then in chapter 35, Reuben slept with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and mother of his brothers, Dan and Naphtali. Uh, again, what's the reason that he did this? Um, many argue that it was probably a coup attempt against Jacob, and this is not an unprecedented thing for a person to take the concubines of someone that they want to usurp their power from. We saw that with Absalom when he threw King David out of the city. Adonijah tried to do that very same thing with Solomon by asking for Abishag the Shumanite as wife who had been David's concubine in the, in the last days of his life. So this is something that was done. Many feel that this might have been a power grab or at least an attempted one by Reuben but we don't know that for sure. Then, of course, there's chapter 38 right afterwards where Judah marries a Canaanite woman, has three terrible sons, and he mistreats the wife that gets passed down between them. And so, and that's a whole story in and of itself that I'm not going to get into, but it's real ugly and real dramatic. It's straight out of Jerry Springer, and and, and you have to read it for yourself. It's just terrible. Uh, So my point here is, is that this is a pretty dysfunctional and messed up family. And yet, from this supremely dysfunctional family flowed the salvation of the entire world. You guys see this? The salvation and redemption plan of the entire world flowed forth from this really, really messed up family. How is this possible? What do we learn from this? Well, I'm going to suggest to you there are five lessons to learn here. There's probably more. I see five. Two of them are basically sub-points from the first, so it's going to come out as one really big lesson and then two smaller ones. But if you don't have an outline already, they're on the bistro tables if you want to follow along. Uh, But there's five lessons, three with kind of two embedded inside. Okay, first lesson. God redeems the world through sinful people. This is the first. God redeems the world through sinful people. Clearly, the presence of great sin and dysfunction in the lives of Judah's sons and his whole family did not prevent them from being used by God. And from this, we can see that if God can use them, he can use us. There's no question about that. But there's a caveat here. There's a caveat. They stepped into God's plan as they repented of and learned from their mistakes, okay? So keep in mind, incredibly dysfunctional family, God used them, but there was something on their side they repented of and learned from their mistakes over time, and that's part of the process. Judah stands out here more than the others in his repentance. Judah, for example, in Genesis chapter 44, is the one who offered his life in place of Benjamin's. Uh, Again, I'm summarizing here, but when they went to Egypt for grain, um, uh, Joseph set it up, kind of put them in a position, testing his brothers to where they were faced with the prospect of having to leave Benjamin behind as a slave, the other son of Rachel and Jacob. Uh, And they were faced with basically the same prospect as with him. And Judah was the one who said, I will stay as a slave. Just let him go home to his father. It was a completely different situation. And so Judah was had clearly changed and repented there. And also when Judah was confronted by Tamar in Genesis 38, when she was discovered to be pregnant with his child, um, he was the one that said, she is more righteous than I. Right in front of everybody, he owned the mistake. He said, this thing is my fault. It's my fault. 
And so he was, stands out as the most repentant of them in general. However, all of the brothers mourned and were haunted by um, the way they treated Joseph. And it shows over and over again as they're all dealing with him in Egypt. All of them learned from it. All of them were haunted by it and had repented of it. It was just something that stands out more with Judah than anyone else. But the sons of Israel were sinful men who learn from and turn from their sin over time. And in the same way, we can be used by God, warts and all, as we learn and grow from our mistakes. Uh, there's really nothing more tragic than when someone stays in their folly and never learns from it, spins their wheels over and over again, never really learns from their mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes, but it's really sad when we just keep making them and never learn from them. And in the spirit of learning from mistakes, there are two more lessons that we can learn from, the, learn from in this dysfunctional family, and one is from the sons and the other is from the father, and so we'll look at those now, okay? Firstly, resentment. This is regarding the brothers, the sons. Um, resentment that is nurtured leads to great sin. Resentment that is nurtured leads to great sin. When you read an account like this and you ask yourself how a person with a conscience, let alone a whole group of people, could get to the place where they could sell their brother into slavery? Um, how could they even get to a place like this? The answer to that question is that they have been nurturing resentment in their heart for a long period of time. Again, it didn't happen overnight. It's a slow boil. It's something that's been going on in their heart for a long time. And we see this in the text. The brothers were unhappy for a while. And they were most likely feeding off of each other's resentment as well. They seemed to be together in their hatred of Joseph. They complained amongst themselves, and they got angrier and angrier in the process. And over time, their resentment progressed to hatred, and their hatred drove them to murder. Now, you've heard me say this over and over again, but I'm just going to keep saying it because it's so important. Because uh, it's important for us to find practical avenues for this. And obviously, there's ways... Uh, that we can nurture resentment. But right now, much of the news and social media that we're taking in is designed to fuel resentment, to, to, to fuel resentment in us. Would you believe me if I told you that? Much of what we've taken in our phones and what we're seeing on the screen is designed to make us angry and generate resentment in us and fuel that. And that's why we're so divided right now as a people, as a land, and as a country. We're so divided, just like, just like Jacob's brothers were divided. The same thing. It's because we're fueling resentment. <coughs> Those things are designed to make us angry. And when that kind of stuff boils inside for long enough, it can move us to do some pretty crazy things that we would not otherwise do. And that's why it's so important to keep that in check and to watch what we're taking in. And when you feel yourself getting angry and resentful over the stuff you're taking in, probably not a good idea to keep doing it because it's going to lead to some terrible things. Resentment, when it is nurtured, leads to great sin. That's the first lesson. Secondly, this is regarding the Father. Sin that is not addressed in our lives is passed on. Sin that is not addressed in our lives is passed on. Think about it for a minute here. Jacob was brought up in a house full of favoritism. Jacob himself was brought up in a house full of favoritism. His father Isaac preferred his brother Esau, remember? And his mother Rebecca preferred him over Esau. And this created an environment of tension and rivalry, which prompted Jacob to deceive his father and steal the birthright that was intended for Esau. And then, as a result of that, he had to flee and live in exile for decades for fear that Esau might kill him. Kill him. So, do you see how Jacob himself kind of came out of that? You think he might have learned something from that experience? Nope, not at all. We see Jacob doing the exact same thing that he was brought up in his own home to do. Uh, he favored his wife Rachel over Leah. He favored Rachel's sons. Um, particularly in this case Joseph, over, her, uh, over the other sons. And in doing so, he created an imperfect, a, a, excuse me, in doing so, he created a perfect environment for the resentment of his sons to flourish. He created this, he tilled the ground in order to cultivate the resentment that was happening. He created the environment. He may not have been the one that did the deed, but he helped foster it all with his favoritism. So what we learn from this is that what we don't address in our own lives 
we pass on to our children. Jacob did what he was taught to do. Uh, he came from an environment like that, and he created the same environment. In fact, he did a worse job in his own home. What we don't deal with in our lives, we pass on to our children and to those we influence. And have you ever seen your kids do stuff that you don't like and realize that they learned it from you? It's kind of a scary thought. I mourn whenever I see my kids do things um, that they picked up from me that I don't necessarily want them to pick up. And I don't, you know, I don't mean to embarrass you know, them over here now, but you know, I, I genuinely am glad in hindsight that my son was born later. Um, I, uh, I remember in the beginning thinking, oh, I'm going to have a, you know, a man-child and have a son. You know, I had daughter, daughter, daughter. And I was like, oh, you know, it's, I'm happy. Everything's good. Don't get me wrong here. I'm probably digging a hole now. But my point is, is that uh, I can now see in hindsight that it was a very good thing that I didn't have a son until later on down the line because there was a lot of stuff, a junk I dealt with and unlearned from age 20 to age 30, and 30s when Danny was born. Um, and one thing I noticed pretty early on with him was that he was paying attention to me a lot more than they were, simply because he was a boy and I'm a boy. I noticed that from the very beginning. He was different in lots of ways. I mean, his eyes were just busy in a way that the girls weren't from the time he was born. Even when Holly was holding him, his eyes were just looking for trouble, you know, looking for things to get into. But I also noticed that he was more interested in the things that I was doing than the girls were. And so I'm glad that I was able to unlearn some of those things uh, so that he was, hopefully he didn't pick them up. But uh, the same is true for all of us here. Unaddressed sin is not, desi- is not benign. It, uh, it gets passed on. And if we don't deal with the junk in our own lives, we tend to pass it on to our kids and those we influence. And we see that happening right here. <coughs> but that's lesson one. Lesson two is that God redeems the effects of sin to serve his purposes. God redeems the effects of sin to serve his purposes. <coughs> Joseph was the victim here, unquestionably. He was the victim of a horrendous crime. He was sold into slavery. (coughs) And yet God turned the entire situation into something redemptive, didn't he? He put Joseph right where he needed to be to save his whole family and the world around, for that matter, from famine. Now to be clear before we go any further, we're not saying that God instigates or delights in the bad things that happen to us. We're not saying that at all. But he does redeem them, and he does turn them into something good as we, as we stay with God and hang with him through it. Again, he doesn't delight in these things. He doesn't want these things to happen. But when these things do happen, he redeems them, and he turns them into something good. And we can experience that as we hang in there with God through it. Joseph never walked away from God, and in the end, he was able to say to his brothers, and I quote, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. He was able to see how God turned the whole situation into something good. In other words, what Joseph said to his brothers is, God turned your evil into something good. So there is this verse that we quote all the time in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we kind of hesitate to quote that to people, understandably, when they're going through tough times. You know, it feels insensitive. And I understand that. I'm not saying to go do it. But the verse is true. Uh, Living in this world full of sin, there are going to be heartaches and painful things that happen to us, and we really can't change that um, on this side of heaven. But God has a way of taking those things and turning them into something good if we hang in there with them and we don't walk away in the process. And that's what happened with Joseph, and he was able to see the thing through the other side. And there's a lot of rough things that have happened in our lives. And I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room, or most people in this room, can probably look back and say, yeah, that was a tough thing, but now I can see how God turned it around for good. This is real. This happens. And lastly, we lean into God's Redemption of evil through forgiveness. Again, God is redeeming evil for something good. That, doesn't, that hasn't changed. That, that's going to happen. But we lean into that. We embrace that. We become part of that through forgiveness. Through forgiveness. <coughs> Think about it. God used an incredibly bad situation to 
put Joseph in the right place at the right time to save lives. However, he had to forgive his brother's sin, as awful as it was, to save their lives. Does that make sense? Um, they sold him into slavery. God brought him to that place. But if he hadn't have forgiven them, they would have all perished. Um, a lesser man than Joseph would have said, my family abandoned me, and so now I'm going to abandon them. It's just fair. Life is hard. Justice is tough. But Joseph forgave them. And the fact that he forgave them is what enabled him to say, come to Egypt. I'm going to use what I gain to take care of you now. I'm going to lean into this process of God turning this whole thing around for good. And the point here is, is that we can't be part of God's redemption plan if we refuse to forgive those who sin against us. We say we want to be conduits of his grace and his mercy and his love. We say we want to be part of the redemption plan. If we don't forgive people, if we harbor resentment and we won't forgive people who sin against us, we really can't be part of it. Unforgiveness is a spiritually fatal thing. It's a terrible thing. And there are verses in the Bible that really emphasize how serious unforgiveness is. For example, this is Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Heavy stuff. What does he mean by that? It's hard to unpack, you know, with some of the theological ideas in our mind. But suffice it to say here, we can't really lean into what God is doing and partner on our side with that if we don't forgive. It is essential that we forgive. And Israel would not have been saved as a nation if Joseph wouldn't have forgiven his brothers. It's that serious. In terms of the world we live in, either we forgive the sins against us and we become part of the solution, or we remain bitter and resentful and we remain part of the problem. We're either going to be part of the problem with this world or part of the solution. We become part of the solution by forgiving those who sin against us and stepping into the redemption process. So, there we go. The sons of Israel. They were not perfect people, were they? That family was a mess. It was a whole big mess. But God used them to bring about his redemption plan for the entire world regardless. And what that means is, is that God can use us as well today. Warts is all, warts and all, sins and all. But we have to be able to lean into it. We have to be able to embrace it and do our part. He's working, but we have a part in it as well. And so my prayer is that we would have forgiving hearts, understanding hearts, faithful hearts to be able to see this thing through to the other side, and a willingness to learn from our mistakes. I know it's something I pray for myself, and I'll pray for all of us right now, if you'll bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, um, there is, again, such an incredible example with the sons of Israel about how you can just redeem everything for good, even the most terrible things that happen in this world. And of course, we're not saying at this, at this time that any of that was good. All we're acknowledging is your infinite wisdom to be able to turn even the bad things into something good and useful. And Father, we thank you that you are that wise and that powerful. And we pray that as you do that in our lives, that we would recognize that and we would lean into it with a heart to learn and to be humble and a heart to forgive according to the example that you gave through Jesus. And we